In this video, I'll show you six practical tips you can take today to improve the security of your iPad and your iPhone. Let's go. Welcome everybody to TechCraft, this is Rob, and today's video is all about improving your mobile security so you can make sure you're not such an easy target when you're online or when you're traveling with your mobile kit. If you're anything like me, your entire digital footprint is stored on your iPhone and your iPad. I do all my banking through my iPhone, all of my emails, all of my photos, pretty much every piece of media I have is on my iPad. If anybody ever got hold of those devices, they would pretty much have access to my entire life. And because of this, I try to take mobile security as seriously as I can. I'll put links to all the products and apps and services that I mentioned in the description below. I'm not sponsored by any of these manufacturers, but some of the links will be affiliate links. If you think there's any products or services that I've missed, please do chuck a comment below. I'd love to hear from you on that. But let's get started straight away with tip number one. So my first tip is this, make sure you have all the basics right. If you don't have a password or a passcode on your iPad or iPhone, please make sure you do that straight away. Even if you keep your device at home, we have an iPad that we keep solely in our house. We have a passcode on that, just on the off chance that we maybe take it out one day, forget that it's not secure, and that's the device that gets stolen. If you're using Face ID, then I recommend enabling attention checking. If you've ever had a weird situation where you've got your iPad lying on the side and you see that it's open, that's because the camera has caught your face kind of like off to the side and it's unlocked. With attention checking, there's an extra level of security that makes sure the camera checks that you're actually actively looking at the screen. I've had too many occasions where my iPad was unlocked on a coffee shop table because I didn't have attention checking enabled. I also like to set my iPad and my iPhone to wipe completely if there are more than 10 failed attempts at the passcode. Of course, there is the ability to remotely wipe the iPad or iPhone, but I don't wanna to have to remember or realize that my device has been taken. I'd rather it just automatically wipes itself. This brings me to tip number two, which is to make sure that you have Find My Devices enabled. It seems like such a silly little service, but if you lose your device or if it's stolen, maybe you can find it, maybe you can encourage someone to return it to you, but at the worst case, you can remotely wipe it. This has come in handy for me so many times. My wife left an iPhone at the airport once, which we were able to get back because they kindly shipped it to us. I've left an iPhone and the train once and had to wipe it and never managed to get it back. Please make sure you have this enabled. Good password practice really matters, and it can be really hard when using a device like the iPad, and especially a device like the iPhone, to really enforce good practice. When I'm talking about good password practice, I'm really talking about three things. Password length, password complexity, and password uniqueness. The longer the password, the harder it will be for an attacker to crack it. If you create your password solely from lowercase English alphabet characters and you create a password of six characters, it will take about 30 seconds to crack that. If you extend that to eight characters, it'll take about six hours. And then once you extend that out to 12 characters, you're looking at about 300 years to crack. It's not just the length that governs how hard a password is to crack, the complexity also matters. If we extend our password character set from just lowercase letters to lowercase, uppercase, and digits, then that six character password now takes just over 90 minutes to crack. An eight character password takes over eight months. And our 12 character password now takes about 10 million years to crack. So you can see how together the length and the complexity really factor into making it harder for a cracker to get at your password. Now all of these cracking timeframes go completely out of the window if you use a password that is very common, like password123. Crackers are wise to these passwords. Even when you substitute the A for an ampersand or you substitute it for an at sign or something like that, they're completely wise to this. They've pre-compiled lists of all these common passwords and they'll check them first in a very efficient way. For maximum security, you should create a randomized unique password for every app and for every service that you use. Not only does this prevent you from being cracked because your password is on a list somewhere, it also means that if your password leaks, say from the website of a popular gaming console, then it's only that one password that has leaked and you don't have to go and reset your password on tens or hundreds of different services. Maintaining this kind of good password practice is hard in general and is even harder on a small device like the iPhone. You don't really wanna be typing in a 24 character password that looks roughly like line noise on that small screen. And unless you have a really good memory, you're not going to remember all those different passwords. And of course, we're not going to write our passwords down on a post-it note or in a fancy little book somewhere. 
Thankfully, we can solve this problem with a password manager. The basic premise of a password manager is that it generates unique passwords for you for every service. It stores these passwords and it provides you with an interface to fill them in on the website or in the app that you're using. You never have to remember a password or even really think about what the password actually is. The password manager takes complete control of that. Most password managers provide really deep integration with the operating system and with the browser to make sure the whole process of capturing passwords and filling them in is really smooth. I've been using 1Password for about 10 years now. I've got it on my Mac, on my iPhone, on my iPad, on my Android tablets, on my Nvidia Shield. I use it everywhere. It's even on my Windows machine. So it really does provide a kind of a, a complete service for me. I even have the family account so that my wife has a password manager and she can use that to secure her passwords. And it even provides the ability for us to share passwords for things like Wi-Fi routers and for services that have a shared password like Netflix. I've used LastPass as well at work, and I think that works just fine. I do think the integration with iOS and Safari is not quite as smooth as it is in 1Password. There are loads of other choices as well. The two big ones that come to mind are Dashlane and KeePass. I've not really used these. I used KeePass a little bit in the old days on Linux, but plenty of people have good things to say about these. So you can try all four and see which one works best for you. The key thing is that you choose a password manager and you use it to manage all of your passwords. Using unique strong passwords for every site and app will definitely improve your online security, but you can go one step further and use two-factor authentication wherever it is supported. With two-factor authentication, you authenticate against a service using something you know called the knowledge factor and something you possess called the possession factor. Now, the knowledge factor is typically your password and the possession factor is most commonly your cell phone. There are two ways in which you can use your cell phone as a possession factor. You can receive one-time codes via SMS, or you can have a dedicated app that will generate those codes for you. SMS seems really convenient because you don't have to fiddle around with an extra app, but it is known to be insecure and has been cracked in the past. The underlying SS7 network for SMS is not particularly secure. So don't rely on that for services you really care about. It's probably better than nothing, but I would definitely urge you to use a one-time code app wherever possible. So 1Password actually has support for one-time codes already. You can get dedicated apps like Google Authenticator and Microsoft Authenticator. If your organization is using Office 365 or Exchange, then Microsoft Authenticator actually supports kind of like a push system where it just prompts you to say, hey, do you want to authenticate on this service? You may have seen something similar if you share my addiction to the drug known as World of Warcraft. If you're using Blizzard's Authenticator, it will push codes out to you as well. I consider a unique strong password and a one-time code based two-factor authentication as standard for pretty much every online service and app that I use. For those services that I care the most about though, I actually go one step further and use a dedicated hardware possession factor. Support for hardware possession tokens is increasing. I already use it on Google and I use it on GitHub and I use it on Dropbox. And I'm finding more and more apps supporting it regularly. So it's definitely worth investing in. I'm using the Titan security kit that I picked up on the Google store. In the box, it comes with one USB key like this and one Bluetooth key like this. And I've now used this on every device that I have. So it's on my iPhone, it's on my iPad, on the Windows computer, on the Android tablet, on the Shield, it's everywhere. And I have to say I've been really surprised at how well and how seamless it has worked. I've had bad experiences with things I've bought from Google in the past and I was not holding out much hope, but it has truly been a seamless experience and I can highly recommend it. In the box, you get this little USB cable that allows you to use the Bluetooth key as a USB key, and you get this USB-A to USB-C adapter so you can use the USB key in a USB-C device like a MacBook Pro. It's really great that everything comes in the box. I was able to get every device working without having to rustle around for extra adapters. I paid 50 pounds for this on the Google store, and I think it goes for $50 in the US. It seems like a bargain to me because it really is a cool device. When you're setting this up for something like Google or for Dropbox, you need to make sure that you set up both keys on every service. One is intended to be a backup. So I keep the little USB one safe at home, somewhere no one can find it. And then I use my Bluetooth one to carry with me. I have it on my key ring and I have just a little cable with me in case I need to use it as a USB key. If you ever work on any kind of public Wi-Fi or network that you don't own, then you really do need to use a VPN.
at a basic level, the VPN will protect you from just kind of frustrating network shenanigans you often find on public networks, like when they throttle traffic to things like Netflix, or when they redirect you to adverts, or when, just to annoy me clearly, they block SSH outbound so I can't get my work done. Beyond that though, the VPN will prevent the network you're running on from snooping on your traffic. Even if you're visiting secure websites, the network can still see where you're going. It can't necessarily see what you're sending or what you're receiving, but it can see where you're going. And it is possible on public networks for an attacker to pretend to be Google or pretend to be Dropbox. There have been attacks like that in the past, and the VPN just prevents that from happening. You don't have to be super vigilant all the time if you have the VPN in the way. Let me be clear though, this is not end-to-end -end encryption like you might get with WhatsApp. Your VPN provider can still see the destination sites you're going to, can still snoop on your traffic. And there are plenty of nefarious VPN providers out there who have been known to do bad things with the data flowing through them. So you have to be careful when you're picking your provider. Now I was really pleased in the last month or so when Cloudflare which is a company that's well respected in the engineering space, released their free VPN service, which is called Warp. I've been using Warp now for about a month, and I have to say the UI is really clean. Uh, it's super easy to set up and configure, especially if you're not a technical user. And the service for me, at least, has been very reliable. I walk around London a lot, I've been using the train, I've been using the tube, and it seems to move between networks pretty seamlessly. There have been the occasional hiccup, as you would expect, but I'm overall very, very happy with it. If you want to look elsewhere, there are other reputable VPN services. One that you'll see around YouTube a lot is NordVPN. Never used it, but a lot of people I know speak very highly of it. Kind of weirdly, if you're looking for Warp on the App Store, it's actually already part of Cloudflare's 1.1.1.1 app, and I have put a link for that in the description below. So as a bonus tip, I wanted to show you this cool little bit of kit. This is a USB data blocker. Now, if you've ever plugged your device into a public USB socket, say on an aeroplane or on a, in a hotel room, then you're actually at risk of having your data exfiltrated while you're charging up. And there have been attacks that have been proven to do this. So this is really simple. All it does is disconnect the data wires inside the USB. So power works, but data doesn't flow. I paid, I think, £8.50 for this in the UK, and I think it goes for around $11.50 in the US, and that's for two. So you can just buy them and chuck them in your bag, and they're just there when you need them. It's a really handy little device. So as I said at the beginning, there's not really such a thing as perfect online security, but there are some simple and quick steps you can take to really improve your own personal security to make you less of a target. I'd love to hear from you if you have your own tips and tricks and practices for security. So please do chuck a comment below if there's something that you're doing that you think I need to know about. I'm always looking for ways to improve my practice of security just so that I can be a, a, a safer online citizen. I hope you found this video entertaining and I hope you found it useful. If you did, please hit like, please hit subscribe. And don't just hit subscribe, but hit the bell as well so you don't miss out on any of the upcoming content. I'll be posting many more tips, tricks, tutorials and reviews related to all things tech, but in particular Apple, iPad and iPhone. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.